Um, so yes, indeed, I, I will try to briefly encapsulate a lot of information in, in this 20 minutes. Um, views on species over time, I'm not going to get um, everybody's views in, and then uh, challenges to our views from, from genomics. And I'll discuss a bit of our recent work and a, a bit of other stuff. So to start off with Linnaeus, um, of course he, I think, really invented the modern use of the term species, you know, and the, the Linnaean binomial is what we really mean now uh, by species. And at first he thought, of course, species were unchanging, but then, as, as other speakers have already mentioned, he later interpreted some species as hybrids and began to realize that there could be evolutionary change because of that. And he sort of modified his views on the fixity of species because of that. Now that, I think, uh, seems to me to have led to a, a lot of interest in understanding species and people started crossing species all over. And um, we've already had uh, mention of the hybridizers, Kolderuta and, and, and Gertner, who, who uh, hybridized, but there were lots of other people, um, uh, ultimately leading to uh, Mendel. Um, meanwhile, Charles Darwin came along, of course, and uh, 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 argued that species were not fixed, and you could have uh, speciation. Species could evolve from one another, and in fact, that all of life probably evolves from a single source. Um, and uh, speciation, his idea of speciation was via the principle of divergence, which essentially in modern terms is divergent selection and character displacement. Um, he, inc incidentally, I mean, those who like allopatric speciation, he certainly included geographic uh, separation in this, uh, but he felt that some processes maybe after what we would consider speciation were, were going to drive species apart to living together in communities. Um, and uh, as for species themselves, he was a bit vague, perhaps. Uh, he said, no one definition of species has yet satisfied all naturalists. Yet every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he speaks of species. Um, this is his principle of divergence explained. And this sort of leads to a tree-like um, evolution. Uh, and uh, on page 485, I think he, he, he explains really clearly what he meant by species in The Origin of Species. His book uh, was, contrary to, to some, uh, pe the, some later people argued, I think the, a book about the origin of species. Um, but what he meant was, that they evolved. So, of course, they were a little bit less real than they were before evolutionary thought. Uh, the only distinction between species and well-marked varieties is, is that the latter are known or believed to be connected at the present day by intermediate gradations, whereas spe species were formerly this, this connected. In other words, you could distinguish them. Even if they overlap spatially, you can distinguish them. And that seems to me a good enough definition. To, for him to proceed. He, of course, was dealing with a, a, a fixed species concept that many taxonomists had at the time, and he was translating how those, um, those species that people had defined in taxonomy um, could evolve. And um, there, there are lots of other people who've discussed species and said Darwin was wrong and so on and so on. Um, in the late part of this period, there were a few defenders of Darwin, and, and among them was this marvellous person, um, uh, E.B. Poulton, uh, who studied butterflies, um, and he was the president of the Royal Society, and he, he actually wrote, I think, what is the first species concept paper, a really long discussion of what is meant by species, and this was in 1904. Interestingly, he had just been given a book of mimicry and speciation, which included Henry Walter Bates's paper, Alfred Russell Wallace's paper, and uh, another guy called Treeman, who, who were discussing mimicry and speciation um, in, uh, in the Christmas of 1903, just before he gave this address in January uh, uh, 1904. So, um, I can sort of imagine him sipping his port, you know, after the children have gone to bed and uh, thinking, uh, what am I going to say at this presidential address and coming out with this thing about species? 
And it's a really good read. Um, it's rather chatty. Oh, I just mentioned lovely facial hair, but not quite as good as uh, Joseph Hooker's <laughs> eyebrows, I think. <laughs> um, Poulton uh, shows by historical analysis that the dogma of the fixity of species was actually quite recent in human thought and cites all sorts of people um, uh, in support of this idea, including religious writers. Um, and then following, so, so he felt it was like the Puritans, uh, a, a Puritan idea uh, that led to the idea of fixity of species, and in particular uh, Milton uh, and, and people like that who, who, who caused all the problems. Of course, those people came over here, and that's why we have so many creationists here. <laughs> um, so uh, following um, uh, Huxley and others, he argues, yeah, so that, uh, and then he comes up with his own uh, species conception, all right? And it's, it's, it's now we're starting to sort of philosophize about species, whereas Darwin was deliberately avoiding philosophizing about species. Interestingly, Darwin, in later editions of The Origin of Species, had a glossary but he didn't have species in there. So everyone says, well, of course, he didn't really believe they were real. Um, I don't think that's true. I think he, he, he wouldn't have described so many species of barnacles if he, if he didn't, <laughs> didn't understand you know, taxonomy and what a species was. Anyway, he argues in a rather modern way, I think, that, that uh, it's convenient to consider various sort of groupings uh, of individuals uh, groups defined by the linear me method of diagnosis. This is sort of what Meyer uh, calls the typological species concept. You diagnose it by beings of mor mor morphological characters. Forms which freely interbreed together are called syngamic. And uh, by this he meant, I think, the biological species concept as we know it now. Um, forms uh, descended from common ancestors or from a parthenogenetic or self-fertilizing ancestor, he called sine epigonic, epigonic. He was really fond of Greek terms, and he loved <laughs> coining terms. He coined the term aposematism as well. And he, uh, in, in among all this, there's the derivation and the Greek letters and everything. Um, and then finally, there is geographic distribution. Forms found together in certain geographic areas may be called sympatric. Uh, and the occurrence of forms together may be and sympatry, and the discontinuous distribution, he said, was asympatry. Um, and what he really believed was that a species was uh, a syngamic and synepigonic group of individuals. All right? So that's, that seems to me like a sort of slightly uh, blend of the phylogenetic and the biological species concept. I think it's a, a, a really good read. I suggest you read it. Um, another guy who talked about species and this is really an interesting uh, area. This book I just took out of the Herbarium Library, and they told me under no circumstances am I allowed to take it away from bio labs. So I'd love to hand it around. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't take it. But it's this, he wrote the most wonderful book in 1916. You can imagine the First World War is raging, right? Um, the Dutch are deciding not to write in German anymore because they're the aggressors. And so they start writing in English and, and French. And, and he wrote in, in English this book. Uh, and it's a beautifully written book, very chatty and uh, uh, interesting. Um, and he, uh, what I want to talk about in particular, well, he, the one thing about this book is he believed that all uh, variation was created by hybridization. He didn't believe in mutation. Um, he, he was sort of fighting against the Mendelians, I think, at this time. Um, but he introduced the idea of a lineon. This is sort of more or less the syndiagnostic idea of Poulton. Um, and he thought this could include a number of pure breeding forms. And then he ha also had the, the Jordanone. Um, and this is Alexis Jordan. Um, who is a French botanist who was interested in micro species. These are things that completely bred true when you, when you put them into captivity. And then uh, in 1917, a separate paper written in French now, um, he, he invented the term syngamion. And that's basically, I think, what we mean by the biological species today. Uh, and he felt that syngamions were really often sort of contained multiple 
forms, but um, again, I think he sort of was intermediate between believing the Jordanone and the Syngamian were the true species. All right, and then we have this sort of uh, uh, this this period uh, later on with um, Dobzhansky uh, introducing um, a species concept that was very like uh, Lotzi's Syng Syngamian, and in fact he cites Lotzi um, in this. And you can see that the New Philosophy of Science journal um, had started up and people were starting to philosophize and these uh, immigrants from Europe who had been much better trained in philosophy probably than most uh, Americans uh, were, were, were felt they, they could you know, write um, more philosophical papers about what species were. And so this is the, the species concept. Um, concept was in use already, but... Um, these people, uh, Ernst Meyer, who I was lucky enough to meet, lovely guy, very uh, friendly and uh, talkative, um, even uh, at the age of whatever he was, 94 then, when I met him. Um, he, he uh, I, I don't think Dar um, Dobzhansky never criticized Darwin, but Meyer actually made a point of criticizing Darwin. I would say Meyer was a great promoter of Darwin and, and did a lot to kind of established evolutionary thought, but he criticized Darwin about species. He always thought he was wrong about species. And he said even Darwin slipped back into typological thinking. Um, anything that is typological, incidentally, in Meyer's writing is bad um, <laughs> in his discussion on species and varieties. I think Cladius were accused of being typ typological, weren't they? Yep. <laughs> And in particular, he said, you know, Darwin failed to solve the problem indicated by the title of his work, which I think is sort of generally believed today. Uh, I personally don't believe that. He also, in discussion with him, he told me he, 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 had, he had been the one who really distinguished allopatry from sympatry, and he did introduce the term allopatry. Uh, but I pointed out that even in 1942, he'd cited Poulton um, for... Uh, in his table, which included sympatry, I think, and allopatry. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, Poulton did as well. <laughs> um, incidentally, it's interesting. Meyer does have a copy of Poulton, 1908. Um, this is his book. Uh, this is from, uh, this was given by Meyer's daughter to Axel Meyer, uh, the fish man. And uh, he, he, he gave me a photocopy of this. Um, it was probably given to him by Oscar Heinroth, who, who's, who's a famous behavioral um, uh, person, sort of one of the forefathers of Tinbergen's group, and, and, and Lawrence. Uh, I can't believe he was given it in 1908, because that would have made him four years old, I think. Um, but uh, he must have been given it in the 30s, when, when Heinroth and, and Lawrence and Meyer were together in Berlin. Uh, but anyway... So, so between Dobzhansky and Meyer, they sort of left the impression that basically Darwin had no idea what he was talking about when he was discussing species. And uh, this is Gordon McCourt, who actually I agree with the majority of this paper. Gordon McCourt uh, sort of sets up as a kind of, um, as a situation to explain. Uh, simply put, while Darwin composed his book with the subject entitled The Origin of Species, he explicitly and surprisingly denied the existence of those originating species. He not only did not have a species definition, he ceased to believe in them altogether. One then is confronted with, in the words of the philosopher John Beattie, the perplexing proposition that species originate and evolve naturally, even though they're not real. <laughs> um, with which I have a, a lot of sympathy. But uh, it's worth reading the paper. It's really an a opposition to John Beatty's paper <laughs> on the same topic. Anyway, so what about the data? So I work on Heliconius. One of the first people to work on it was a great friend of Darwin's, uh, the, uh, Fred Henry Walter Bates. And, uh, and we, we, we heard how Bates and Wallace went to the Amazon together um, Bates was really interested in the origin of species, and uh, in his mimicry paper, it's really about speciation. The whole thing is about how, how one species ch changes to another. And a lot of it is a taxonomic treatise on these, on these butterflies. And he found sort of the first hybrid zone and discussed you know, how there was a sort of continuity between uh, 
these two species, as he thought. He thought this was a Heliconius melpomene, Heliconius thelxiope. Um, in general, today we would call them intraspecific in, in our group, but it doesn't matter. It's still the same point. You're getting um, divergence that's nearly at the species level. Uh, today, we, we, know, we, we know a lot about these species. Um, we have separated the Ethomians. The Ethomians are actually more closely related to monarch butterflies. They're no longer included in the Heliconidae. Uh, and a lot of what Bates was talking about was with the Ethomians. He knew that they were separate as well. He understood that they were, they were different groups. Um, but they were all included within this sort of uh, polyphyletic group, the, the Heliconidae at the time. Um, and uh, the sort of there are there are two major groups of Heliconius: the um, Erato group and the uh, Melpomene uh, Sylvaniform group up here. And, and I just want to mention this this group is a really fascinating group because it, they're all very closely related to each other, and uh, indeed. Uh, uh, that they, they do some of the best mimicry in the animal kingdom, I think. Um, so this is Heliconius melpomene, different geographic races perfectly match geographic um, forms of Heliconius erato um, right across South and Central America. And this is because they're, they're involved in mimicry. So the, um, it's, it's actually Millerian mimicry in which uh, two poisonous species um, look similar, thereby both gaining some advantage from predation because they teach the predators more effectively to avoid them. Uh, so this is Malarian mimicry. And, and again, Bates actually understood that there was Malarian mimicry and that all the heliconids were poisonous. Um, he, he didn't quite get the, the cool stuff that uh, Muller later discovered, which was make a mathematical model. Muller actually made the first mathematical model to show that uh, Mullerian mimicry was actually advantageous to both uh, groups. So the, the, other, the other group of this Melpomene sylvaniform group, they mimic uh, Ethomians, and, uh, which are a completely unrelated butterfly group. And uh, they, look, they look very different as a result. So these sort of mottled patterns are, are Ethomian mimics patterns. Um, well, one interesting thing about the uh, Heliconius is it's a rapid radiation. And, uh, and so many of the species are still compatible. And I mean the species here. I'm not talking about the geographic forms within the species. These are, these are sympatric entities that are hybridizing. So here's one that uh, a student of my uh, court, he was, he was um, newly arrived from Taiwan. He hadn't worked with butterflies before, so he didn't know that this was an incredibly valuable specimen. And he kept on showing it to people. <laughs> and that's why there's lots of fingerprints all over it. <laughs> it was quite fresh when he caught it. Um, and uh, you know, hybridization between species is very rare per individual. It's like one in a thousand or less than one in a thousand. But many species actually do it in the Heliconius. And because Heliconius is so diverse in their color patterns, you can identify the hybrids. It can be non-sister species as well sisters, as sister species. Um, very often, the hybrids are sterile. Um, usually, the female is sterile and the male is fertile. And you can actually back cross them and uh, uh, you know, mix up color patterns from different species quite easily in the lab. Um, so if you look at this uh, phylogenetic analysis, this is actually an earlier one. Um, we've got better phylogenies now. But yeah, the distribution of the hybridization shown by these stars shows that the Melpomene sylvaniform group is particularly good at it. And in fact, you can cross species from one end of this group to the other of about 15 species. There's also some hybrids in some other recently radiated groups. The, like only Serrata group and the Uides. So most of the work is going to be on the uh, Melpomene sylvaniform group. So that hybrid you just saw is really a non-sister species hybridization between a sylvaniform and a Melpomene. Um, and we became interested when we were starting to do genomes uh, of these species um, in the fact that there's a lot of apparent homoplasy in color patterns, these mimicry color patterns. We don't believe that 
um, hybridization and gene flow between species is important between Heliconius errata and Heliconius malpomini, which mimic each other. But within the malpomini sylvaniform group, we felt it was quite possible, given the fertility of the hybrids, that they may occasionally hybridize and cross the color patterns between the species. Um, and so, you know, there's repeated color patterns, both in the sylvaniforms and the, in the malpomini group. Here's, here's another one, the raid color patterns with Heliconius elevatus uh, being important there. So uh, one, of the, one of the things we did, this is Simon Martin's work and, and Chris Jiggins' group. Um, we looked at sympatric pairs of species of, of these are sister species, Heliconius sydno and Heliconius malpomini. Heliconius timorata and sydno are dubiously separated into separate species, but they're sort of allopatric forms that are very closely related. Um, so these, these are part of the same lineage, Timoretta and, and Sydna. And we have the whole genomes. You can resequence the whole genomes. Cost a few hundred dollars now, um, really cheap. Uh, and uh, so we did four individuals of each species from various localities. Um, if they're sympatric, uh, so, so first of all, the major pattern that you see is the species phylogeny of phylogeny we expect, which is that the Malpomines come out together and the, uh, and the Sydnos are, you know, closely related. Um, but uh, there's a minority phylogeny in part of the genome. These are, these are incredibly, uh, these are actually based on 2,500 trees taken from 100 KB uh, sections of the genome, just uh, windows right across the whole genome. Um, and this minority pattern suggests that the sympatric pair of species that are known to hybridize actually do show uh, a pattern uh, which would tend to produce, uh, you know, so, so basically that part of the genome is more closely related between these different species than it is between other members of the same species. Um, and that, we think, is due to this occasional hybridization. Um, if it was just uh, ancestral uh, polymorphism and, and incomplete lineage sorting, you'd expect another uh, phylogeny to, to take place, which is the, um, which is it, the control phylogeny, all right? This green one where you'd expect sometimes the uh, allopatric malpomony would cluster with the Heliconia sydno, and it doesn't, uh, or it does uh, very occasionally, probably because of phylogenetic error. Um, or because of ancestral polymorphism, perhaps. But this, is, this, this uh, signal of sympatry is much more uh, outweighs it. So in fact, 40% of the genome is showing this pattern of closer relationship. Um, the same is true in Peru. Um, for a variety of reasons, we're not surprised about this. It's probably the same level of hybridization and gene flow. Um, it's the, 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 the outgroup is uh, different, so actually, um, uh, this is less related to, um, well, this is a, uh, anyway, the branch, the branch, uh, it's, a, it's a rooting problem that, that we have uh, to try and look at this. So the geography trees um, are what we find, and they are expected due to in integration. Control trees are expected if it's just incomplete sorting, and the vast bias suggests that there really is a lot of gene flow between these species. Well, what about the color patterns? I'm not going to go into detail here because I've got almost no time, I think. Is that right? <laughs> so, uh, so just uh, this, is, this is the signal of introgression. Um, so so uh, the, the different species that share the same color pattern, where they're required for mimicry, um, there's a very strong signal right at the color pattern locus, suggesting the whole color pattern locus has been uh, switched over. And furthermore, if you look at this species, Heliconius elevatus, which you, you may remember is in a, a quite distantly related group, um, you find that these color pattern regions, the regions where the enhancers of optics which turn on the red color pattern are, um, the phylogeny of those regions uh, suggests that all the rayed color patterns cluster together, and all the, uh, the red forming bar color patterns cluster together. Um, whereas outside the regions, you get a more normal phylogeny, which we expect for the species phylogeny. So again, we suspect this is because there's been selection of, of this 
uh, occasional intergressant uh, between species, quite distantly between non-sister species. So the final thing I'm going to show you is this pair of species which are highly sympatric across the Amazon basin. They produce rare hybrids. Um, the whole you know, nuclear tree shows that the Amazonian forms where they co-occur are much more closely related over uh, most of their genome. Um, and to the exclusion of the allopatric forms of what were considered the same species. Well, you may think we've got the taxonomy wrong and so on. Um, and, you know, who knows what, what you want to call a species. When we look at mitochondrial DNA, this is a whole mitochondrial DNA, there's absolutely no resolution there. Um, but M my mitochondrial DNA barcodes don't help. Um, so we wondered if this was due to gene flow as well. Um, so the hypothesis is that the gene flow in the Amazon, so we would expect that the differences between these very different looking species should show up as having the correct species phylogeny, whereas maybe the rest of the genome has kind of flowed between the two. And uh, we performed that phylogenetic analysis. So this is the species tree of the parts of the genome that, that, we, that, that you can actually distinguish between these two very different looking species which don't hybridize very regularly. And indeed, they do show the expected species phylogeny. So apparently, 98% of the genome in this species is actually being exchanged between these sympatric species. Um, and, uh, you know, most of the genome is actually panmictic across these two species. Although it's rare gene flow, it's frequent enough to completely homogenize the variation between the species. So um, this is a very significant effect, so we really uh, do not expect the species monophyly tree to turn up uh, the amount that it does. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, you know, it could just be Heliconius, but it's not. The same thing is true in uh, um, Anopheles Gambi group. Uh, the, the species topology and the whole genome topology is completely different, and it shows that 98% of the genome has apparently flowed between Arabiensis and the Gambi group uh, quite recently. Um, the Darwin's finches, just look at this species, uh, Geospiza difficilis. Um, lots of hybridization is going on there, and we know this in the Geospizas. Uh, and this, these ABBA-BABA tests show that it's true. So uh, I'm suggesting that uh, this is going to be true in a variety of species, birds, butterflies, insects in general, and mammals as well. There's some great ex mammal examples. So given the genomic evidence about uh, gene flow between species, what are we going to do about the biological species concept or the phylogenetic species concept that we have? And um, uh, credit to Joel Craycroft, I'm actually becoming more of a phylogenetic species concept person. So supposing you have this actual branching pattern in terms of species, but then you have all these reticulations after speciation. You have lots of gene flow. I mean, not lots, but enough to homogenize genomes. If you did the whole genome tree, you'd actually get this sort of tree with one and two being more closely related to each other and you'd predict this green ancestor which never existed. Um, so I, I, I'm saying I would prefer to get the actual species tree because that's the true history of the species. And uh, the species tree is the, is the important thing. And, you know, if, if, you, if you talk to an Anopheles person or talk to a person who works on Darwin's finches or talk to a Heliconius person, we can recognize these species one and two. There's no problem. They're clearly good species. We can see them in the field. They have different color patterns, different ecology, different flight behavior, and so on. Uh, they are what we mean by species. Um, they did diverge at some time in the past, um, and yet they have exchanged a lot of genes. So that the, the average gene history is going to be entirely different from the phylogenetic history of the group. And I think we're going to get have to get used to that. It means all sorts of things for comparative biology, for understanding biogeography. Uh, we, we, we really don't, um, haven't really in, uh, taken all this on board yet in, in our analyses. So I'll stop there. Sorry, sorry to have gone on.